everyone. I'm Inseju Witherspoon, also known as Inse. I'm the executive director of the Children's Environmental Health Network, a national nonprofit working to protect all children from environmental hazards. And I'm quite honored to moderate our next panel, Climate Justice and Health Equity. We are joined by Dr. Gaurav Basu, a pr primary care physician and instructor at Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Shasta Gaon, the environmental director of uh, Paula, Band, Paula Band of Mission in Indians, and Ms. Beth Dauda, a PhD candidate in environmental health at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health. You will find their detailed and impress impressive bios in the Action Center on your screen. Each of them have approaches and approach the issues of climate change and achieving health equity through climate solutions from a different lens. And we'll hear more about that in a minute. As the environmental, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, executive director of Children's Environmental Health Network, we certainly do put the health and well being of children, especially when it comes to impacts from climate uh, implications, primary to all the work that we do. And it's something we deliberate, work on, and definitely strive to uh, be part of solutions each and every day. Just a brief overview of the realities. Today, all children face environmental hazards that harm their growth and development, but children from underserved communities always suffer first and worst. With the continuous threats of climate change, the highest risk children will again suffer the most. With heat stress, infants and children dehydrate quicker than adults, and older children are vulnerable during rigorous outdoor play. Poor and underserved resource communities are less likely to have parks and trees to provide relief, less able to prepare and provide warnings, cooling centers, and accessible health interventions. Longer pollen circumstances are also in seasons are affecting length and longevity, uh, severity of asthma and upper respiratory illnesses, and increasing disparities in asthma prevalence and mortality outcomes by race and ethnicity. A changing climate will increase children's exposures to allergens, such as dust, mold spores, and pollen, and all known to exacerbate asthma and respiratory distress. As a mother of four, I'm witnessing these, cha these changes and challenges personally in our own family. Children are also uniquely exposed during disasters with health effects from often magnified, that are often magnified by poor and disadvantaged children in, in their communities as well. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. And our first speaker is gonna be Ms. Beth. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that great introduction. And I'm really grateful to be here and to be given the opportunity to talk about my work. So I'm a climate and health PhD candidate at Columbia, and most of my work focuses on energy transition. And the reason why I'm passionate about energy is because we all use it, we all need it, but the choices we are given or not given as to where the energy we use comes from have impacts on the environment, on our health, and the health of our lo loved ones. So a couple of examples of how energy is connected to health. In the US, most of the energy we use is generated through the combustion of fossil fuels that account for about 75% of greenhouse gas emissions nationally. And it's not just carbon emissions, right? There's also outdoor emissions, which make areas surrounding power plants a lot more polluted than other areas. A recent study in California showed that after the shutting of power plants, of coal and oil power plants, the, the rate of preterm birth decreased significantly, and more so among Latino women and Black women. Another way that energy is connected to health is through an appliance that we have at home but don't think about very often, gas stoves. Gas has been considered a cleaner fuel for a long time, but it's still a fossil fuel, and so the combustion of gas does release um, pollutants that we are exposed to in our homes. It's been shown that children who live in homes that have gas stoves uh, have a 42% increased risk of developing asthma. And asthma in the US is not just prevalent, it's also very unequal. In the US, about 7% of children suffer, of white children suffer from asthma, compared to 14% of black children and 13% of Latino children. So there are huge disparities there. And in the two examples I've just dis discussed, I distinguished between outdoor air pollution and indoor air pollution. But what we know is that often low-income families, families who don't have a say as to which stoves they have at home, also happen to live in areas that have higher levels of outdoor air pollution. And so they are disproportionately impacted by multiple environmental triggers, leading to what we call in public health cumulative impacts. 
And most of my work is really trying to target those cumulative impact. The question that I ask in my work, both in the US and internationally, is if we are able to, to move towards cleaner energy and uh, renewable energy, who benefits? And it's only when asking these questions that we can truly develop policies and programs that address issues, that address issues of environmental health and, and environmental equity. And this is an important topic that I think we sh should have a conversation about, is the fact that equity cannot just be um, an add-on or something nice to have when we develop policies. It has to be a part, an integral part of the development of policies and programs all along. Otherwise, we, the, the work that we do results in equity washing, which I think as a community of researchers, um, physicians, and program implementers, we should have a larger and more authentic, authentic conversation about. So the road ahead is filled with challenges, um, but I'm really energized and I'm motivated, especially by my generation, generation of scientists who don't shy away from being activists as well, because those two things don't have to be mutually exclusive. And I'm empowered by the fact that the more we know, the more we research and the more we understand, um, the more we are able to, to hold people in power accountable so that we can all move forward uh, toward a more just and equitable climate and environment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very important opening remarks. And just as a reminder, if you have questions, please do pass those along and we'll get to a Q and A in about uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes or so. Our next uh, speaker will be giving a few opening remarks and that's Gorab. And say, thank you so much. Um, you know, I think what's on my mind today, um, it's just a moment of reflection of this extraordinary time that we're living in. And uh, in so many ways, um, it, the, the the challenges, the bigness of the hard issues upon us. Um, in some ways, we've normalized to them. And I just want to take a minute to, to say, I hope you're doing okay. I hope your communities are doing okay. Uh, so many of us um, have had tremendous uh, hurt and harm this year. And I know as a primary care doctor, I've seen that firsthand um, through the lives of my patients, uh, through the deaths that I've seen of the patients I've cared for. Uh, it is a hard time in the world. Um, but I come into this conversation, and I hope through this conference, you all are feeling also a, um, a spirit of determination, uh, a, a spirit that we can do things in a fundamentally different way. And in order to get underneath these converging crises of climate change, COVID, income inequality, uh, and structural racism, it requires us to do deep work. Uh, and the times that we live in challenge us to, uh, to, to do the reckoning, to do the deep work, uh, that we not look away from all that we've seen this past year. We didn't need a pandemic to learn all of these issues. They've always been here. Um, but I know everyone here today is determined to put one foot in front of the other and make sure we have a brighter and healthier future and a more just future. Uh, but in order to make that future, we've got to do some accounting of how we got here. And there's the adage that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. And so when I think about climate change, uh, the, the first definition that comes to my mind um, is um, the work of Dr. Kamara Jones, who's a, a former president of the APHA, who defines structural racism as a system of structuring opportunity uh, and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one's looks, such that it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities, it unfairly advantages other individuals and communities, and it saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. So if we apply that framework to climate change, we see the ways in which a history of redlining has contributed to a way in which, from Jeremy Hoffman's uh, research, has shown that redlined communities are 2.6 degrees Celsius hotter, that these redlined communities are now more prone uh, to flooding and to causing devastation economically for people and their, um, their, their, their properties and their uh, financial stability into the future. Now that we're having a national conversation about infrastructure, it's forced us to think about how policy from the 1950s has put highways um, that transect communities of color and have not only uh, broken communities uh, in half by having these overpasses, uh, has uh, squandered the opportunity for vibrant green spaces, but also has exposed these communities to air pollution. 
And so this is not abstract. This is not about uh, atmospheric, science, atmospheric science and uh, modeling of our climate to me. It translates very clearly into health and health equity. It translates into the faces of my patients that I see every day. And I feel determined that we have to move forward and that the, the crisis that we face of climate change is one that we look at straight in the eye and we determine uh, to do that foundational uh, structural work. And so when I hear studies that show that there is an association of air pollution and heat exposure that increase the rates of premature labor and low birth weight and stillbirth, and that black mothers um, are disproportionately impacted by this, that bothers me in, in the core of my being. I can't, I, I, I can't look past that, and it, I, I just can't stop thinking about that. When I see the ways in which, in all the things I care about as a physician, my patients uh, and um, that I care for in my community health center, the vibrant immigrant community I take care of, um, are disproportionately impacted by these threats. It's foundational to my work. And so it's time for us to connect these dots, to embrace the bigness of our issues uh, that we face, um, to also a quick word on recognizing the impacts globally uh, and the ways in which food security and water scarcity and natural disasters are disproportionately impacting the global south because of the emissions that we have disproportionately put into the climate. Um, it's time for us to, to reckon with it and also see a new path. And I think the new path forward starts with us declaring our values. And for me, it's that we are here on this earth to take care of one another, uh, that we improve our relationships, uh, we heal our relationships with our earth, with each other and future generations, and that we make the commitment to do the deep work and stay accountable to that, to find community with one another, and to make our values of the organizing principles of the policies that we put in place and that the work and the work we do together. I say that with a tone of conviction and even hope. Uh, because I believe that we have everything we need to create that new future. And as hard as these times are, and as how as uh, difficult as these structural issues feel and how heavy they feel, the great thing about doing deep structural work is that you can improve so many things at one time. And so when we support our earth, when we stabilize our climate, there's a cascade of health benefits that come upon us uh, that unlock the opportunity for a brighter and healthier and more just future. And so I hope that we can find within one each other the inspiration to keep going. Uh, I'm so grateful for everything that everyone in this audience is doing together. Um, I believe that climate change is fundamentally an issue of racial justice and health equity, and even more that it's about our interconnectedness and our common humanity, and it's about us taking care of one another. And so I'm um, with with what's all, uh, everything going on at DC right now, um, and with Gina McCarthy rooting us on here. Uh, I'm grateful to be in community with you all and to do this work together. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Looking forward to the discussion to unpack a lot of uh, what you said a bit more, especially getting into some of the actions that we need as we look uh, these needs directly in the eye, as you state. And then finally, Shasta, for your opening remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ense, and I am uh, very happy to be here today. I am coming to you from a place that the colonizers named San Diego, California, but it is Payonkawichum territory. I am the environmental director for the Paula Band of Mission Indians, which is made up of uh, Luiseno and Cupeño people. And I'm not a tribal member myself. My ancestry is European, but it's been my honor for the past 16 years to be able to work in this community, both as the environmental director and as the tribal historic preservation officer. And in my work here, I, both of those things I found are combined because with tribal communities and indigenous communities, climate change and the effects of climate change on the environment and on ways of life cannot be separated from the culture. Culture and environment are inseparable. You know, the people ground who they are in the places that they come from. So all of those things that surround your place, the, the waters, the mountains, the air itself, these are relatives, these are non-human relatives. And anything that impacts them impacts you as a part of that community, the global community, uh, the, the mother earth and her children. 
And so when we're talking about the disparate impacts of climate change from uh, an economic and social justice perspective, and particularly impacts on health, when you're talking about tribal communities in the United States, there is a very, very long history and there is a, a cultural component that are intertwined in the way that we need to look at how health disparities are exacerbated by what's happening now with climate. So there are 574 so-called federally recognized tribal nations in the United States. And that means that these are nations that have a what's called a government to government relationship with the United States. So tribes are, are sovereign. But what does that mean when you're talking about the effects of climate change environmentally, culturally, and from a health perspective? It means that you need to consider that tribes are not given the resources or have access to the resources that they need to be able to help their communities through these impacts. And from the justice side of things and the equity side of things, even though tribes are nations within, as they've been called by the United States government, they are not existing in a, in a vacuum. They are impacted by everything that goes on in terms of United States environmental policy. So when you are looking at interactions that have an effect on tribes, those effects can be exacerbated by the fact that, that tribes are expected to have their own ability to manage those impacts as these independent governments. But we're looking at, you know, if you go back to uh, 1492, you're looking at over 500 years of colonial oppression that have led us to the place that we are today, where tribes are still struggling to overcome and adapt to the you know, genocide and um, colonization and all of these negative things that have happened over those centuries. And yet today, the expectation is that, well, you know, you're an independent sovereign, so why aren't you handling this on your own? Well, my question would be for people to think about as I talk about these things is what, what exactly is it that you expect tribes to do about the climate change impacts on their reservations when the lands that have been left to them are very small, oftentimes very much uh, chosen in the past because they didn't have resources that the colonizers were interested in exploiting. And so you end up creating this situation of generational poverty. And climate change, I want to say, is it's not that it's not on the mind of tribal people, but from a, a, a resource standpoint, there are other things that the folks at tribes and tribal governments have to think of first in terms of access to food, access to healthcare, access to education. We still have instances in some parts of Indian country where there isn't access to clean water. There isn't access to um, dependable electricity. So what are we going to do to help tribes and join with them in our overall fight for climate justice if we're not so far even able to give them the basic things that people are accustomed to in the United States. So that's something I think we uh, really need to address and I hope we can talk about it more today. Yes, thank you so very much. So I think the first, oh, actually we're gonna do uh, two polls first. We're gonna do two polls before we go into the questions and I know questions are also coming in from the audience. So. You all should see that pop up very soon. You'll have about 30 seconds or so to fill it out. Okay, hopefully that wasn't too hard. And I think there's another one now. Well, actually, I should give the results.
okay? So on the first one, 86% said yes uh, to the first question. Thank you for that. And 94% uh, said yes um, to the second question. So just uh, interesting to, to see where, where the, uh, the leaning is of the audience and the participants. So thank you so much for doing that. First question is gonna be for Ms. Bath. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about equity washing, uh, what are the steps that should be taken to better and more authentically build equity into energy policies from your perspective? Um, thank you for that question. So equity washing isn't a term that I've coined or you know have come up with. It's been used by the Green Lining Institute as a way as a way to describe a practice through which um, the equity benefits that can be achieved through a policy or a program are either overstated or made into statements that are misleading. And I think the reason why I've been concerned about this and why the term really speaks to me is because I think when we overstate the equity benefits of a program or a policy, it can actually be more detrimental than not mentioning equity at all, because it leads to um, attention and resources being diverted from that issue that we are claiming that we are addressing. And so I think as we move forward, we need to be more transparent about what equity really is, or the equity we are pretending to work towards. Um, I think there are many ways that we can include equity as an outcome in um, the, the monitoring and evaluation of the policies and programs we put in place. Monitoring and evaluation happens for a lot of outcomes that are different in nature. So there's no reason why it could not you know, um, be used as a framework for um, equity. Uh, and by the same token, I think that equ equity should deliver um, benefits that are both direct, so not like a trickle down um, effect from, from another benefit, a direct benefit to the communities. And, and those benefits need to be, um, I would say meaningful, that they address com communities need that are being identified by the communities themselves. Um, and that, that fill in a gap that otherwise would not have been, would not have been filled. And so I think if we, center equity from the very beginning, from the outset, defining outcomes at the very beginning, and then ensuring that we measure them all throughout the development of a program or a policy, then we are in a much better place to say that we are actually addressing equity issues. Thank you. Um, as my kids say, facts. Those are facts <laughs> you were giving there. Uh, next question is for Shasta, and I hope I'm getting this right. The, a few of these are from Jacqueline DuPont Walking uh, with AME Church and Eco America board member. If you could please address the tribal behavior, not tribal nations, as we call our original re uh, residents in this nation, as demonstrated by those who deny that there is climate change even happening. So from your standpoint, what works? Um, how do we debunk the deliberate misinformation, which I think we would all agree there's a lot of happening around us on so many different uh, messaging and platforms. So if, if the question is, how do we debunk the, the messaging that, that climate change isn't happening, um, at, at this point, I, I find it hard that to believe that there's anybody who, who doesn't see it. Uh, but I find that even in tribal communities, there are people who will say the climate has always changed and, and Indian people have changed with it, so we're going to be okay. Uh, but a, a, a good friend of mine, Celso Viegas, who works for the Tohono O'odham tribe in Arizona, he, he says... Um, it's always changed, but we have to change with it. We're not able to just assume that everything is going to stay in balance without humans doing something about it. So when I come across those people who say it's, it's okay, it's always changed, I ask them to take a look at their own experiences and say, what has changed for you from now based on, or to, compared to when you were a, a child? And get them to understand or, or use their own memories to come up with examples of how things have changed. So here in Paula, the river that goes through the center of the reservation, it, it doesn't flow anymore. And it hasn't flowed regularly for years because of a dam that was, was put on it, but it still used to flow for weeks or even months after significant rainstorms. And now that doesn't happen. And I've talked to some of the older folks in Paula and that has been 
the, the thing that rings the bell for them and they say, that's right, I used to be able to jump from the swinging bridge and into the water, it was deep enough to swim. And now we barely get a trickle. Um, and I tell them, and, and that's not weather, that's climate, because that's changed since you were a child in the 1960s or the 1970s. So I think making it personal to people is one of the best ways to get them to see that something is happening. Yes, thank you. In public health, we definitely do see behavior is hard, right? It's the hardest, one of the hardest uh, elements to achieve. But when people can connect on a human level, you may not agree with everything, <laughs> you may not agree with most, but when you can connect on a human level, that's when we have a history of, of change, as well as huge increased voices on various issues, which I would offer. We still always need to continue to expand our, our tent here, for sure. There's more than enough room for all you listening. Um, if you're not already connected to uh, an or organization, advocate group of, of your choice, there's a lot of work out here where a lot of us can keep you busy um, and, and help uh, lend your voice to a lot of important efforts. And on that note, uh, Gaurav, um, with the various teachings that you provide in your opening uh, comments on the ways that COVID-19 certainly only potentially exacerbates an already very broken, I would say, set of systems that has historically and structurally uh, made sure that health inequities are fed and fostered um, to, to only strengthen, in my, in my opinion. What would, would you see as some primary actions, solutions that we must get right? Yeah, thanks, Sensei. You know, what, right now we are so focused on vaccines as our way of trying to get out of this uh, horrific pandemic we're in, uh, and, and the vaccines are obviously the most immediate important thing for us. My mind really is on how to make sure we mitigate uh, the risks of the next pandemic. And this is where I think one of the biggest intersections of COVID and climate lie is um, the, the role of deforestation, of unhealthy agricultural practices, where we're kind of cutting down many forests to replace it with agricultural practice, I think is one of the biggest um, practices that we need to do some deep and structural work for. Um, just to make clear, uh, COVID-19 is a zoonotic disease. So it started in animals and then spilled over into the human population. And so we are... Um, we are changing our earth. We are moving into places that we weren't before. We are disrupting equilibrium in our nature, and we are coming into interfaces with animals that we haven't. So this virus has sit, sat, some viruses have sat in equilibrium in their ecosystems, and we're dis disrupting that stability uh, by our own practices. So, so in terms of deforestation and agricultural practices, I think it's a critical, I would argue, the most important piece of pandemic mitigation going forward. And I think, you know, again, I think that once you start doing this deep structural work, you see the connections of everything everywhere. I mean, just this morning, I was emailing with a friend of mine who does uh, community public health uh, gun violence mitigation research at a public health school. And one of his approaches is to create green spaces uh, in communities and really create community, um, uh, you know, to invest in communities and green spaces. And so, um, and, and there's other research showing the importance of green space and mental health and, and kind of some of these highways that we were talking about. There's uh, Pete Buttigieg right now is thinking about using the Civil Rights Act to, to really investigate highways in, in Houston. And so if we reimagine these spaces and we create these green spaces, suddenly mental health issues, gun violence issues, um, climate mitigation, heat islands, all of these things suddenly can be spoken to at the same time. Not to mention the issues of air pollution. Important studies have shown now that people who have exposure to chronic air pollution are more likely to die from COVID um, than people who have not. Um, and the final thing I'll just say is that I, I really do think it's a critical to be very concrete about it. Um, I um, I'm very heartened and encouraged by the American Jobs Plan, and there's a very serious national discussion right now about infrastructure and investment. Uh, and really, uh, really appreciate everything Shasta and uh, Ms. Fifth has said about measuring things and um, and really not doing equity washing. Um, this plan is 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 committing to 40 percent of, of benefits to. Um, uh, historically disenfranchised communities. Um, so, you know, Ms. Biff is describing how we've got to measure things and we also have to invest in those things to create accountability. So we're not just, there's no time to just talk about it anymore. We've got to do the work. Exactly. Uh, thank you so much for that. This is a general one. Anyone please jump in or, or multiple folks. 
how do we convince the unconvinced? Uh, we all know that there's a lot of deep structural work that is necessary. We didn't get here overnight. As Gaurav said, we have a system that was perfectly designed for what it's doing. Um, it was not just happenstance uh, that, that we are here. It's going to take a bit to get out. It's going to take more than just those that are kind of, if you will, on the side of climate and health. We have a lot more folks that need to kind of understand, depending on where they are, their leverage points, their spheres of influence, that they also have a, a role here individually, where they sit in their communities and even beyond. How do we convince the unconvinced to be a part of the deep-seated work that truly has to be done? I have a few thoughts Thank you. on that. Um, it, it, it relates a little bit to what I said uh, to the previous question, but I, first of all, I think that it's okay for us to embrace our frustration with the people who seem to not be convinced that uh, it, it is really, really frustrating that there are still people who who either say nothing is happening or even worse might say um, it's actually going to make things better. You know, I, I don't. I don't like freezing in the middle of the winter. So if it gets warmer in Minnesota, that's okay with me. Uh, in the United States, I think it's particularly difficult because we do have a culture here that is very focused on the individual. And so we're always thinking about what impact does it have on me instead of thinking broadly in terms of not only what impact does it have on me, but what impact does it have on, on the community? So, the same thing pertains, as I said in my previous response, which is to, I think, guide people into understanding how these climate changes, the consequences do have a personal impact on them. But instead of talking about things that seem really remote, like melting ice and sea level rise, which even though San Diego is, is a coastal city, for the most part, people don't think about that being an effect on them. Instead, you need to help them understand things like changes in patterns of, of vectors. Are we gonna get more dis, uh, diseases from say disease carrying mosquitoes? And is that something that can affect you? Well then you need to, to help do something about that, but you helping to do something about that is something that's gonna help the entire community. So getting people to a place where they see that what helps the community also helps them, I think is one way to go forward. Um, again, we, we have a good example with what's happened with COVID over the last year plus that some people don't see it that way. They see it more as wearing a mask is my personal decision and I don't care about the community. But I think we've also seen that there's a response to that where people say, why, how come you don't care about me? I care about you, that's why I'm wearing this mask. And I think if we can leverage that experience with COVID into a climate change experience, me keeping the mosquitoes out of my yard is also keeping the mosquitoes out of your yard, um, can, can help people see that there is an immediate effect and they can take action that will, will help themselves as well as help others. And to, can I make a quick comment please, on it? Please. Yeah, you know, I, I do want to uplift the the fact that the attitudes about climate change and its importance have dramatically changed. You know, and I've really gone to kind of Yale's and uh, George Mason's uh, work on this. You know, it's so ex exciting to see how much attitudes have changed in in recent years. And I would argue, especially after the IPCC report in 2018, I've seen such a sea change. We see that reflected in local and state policy. So I think that's important. And uh, I'll echo uh, Misbeth's comment about her generation really leading so much of that change. These youth movements, I think, are at the forefront of how um, these attitudes have changed. My quick comments on how to engage people on this, um, and, and I'll echo much of what Shasta said, uh, but is that to, to really understand what people care about. You know, climate change is a threat to all the things that people, you know, we all care about. So we got to do some translational work and understand what matters to people and do the work of communicating on those terms. And, you know, health, of course, as a doctor, you know, I want to uplift that, but health is something that we all should care about. It should be at the forefront of this conversation of doing that translational work of how our atmosphere and climate relates to our health. Um, so I'll put a kind of um, a point there of like for any health professionals out there, the really important roles you can play um, in leading change. Um, and, you know, I, I think that um, 
there's also sometimes it is really hard <laughs> again like shasta said to, to kind of feel the frustration when people aren't um under you know are, are dismissing uh climate science but I, I think that's actually a pretty small uh you know part of the overall story and i think a lot of people may be unengaged or may not understand and actually with that communication really could be and i think we should actually just focus a lot of our efforts on on you know the wide um coalition we can create together uh, by communicating more effectively on its impacts on the things we care about. And just one last comment on this. I, I know we have to uh, move on, but I, I just want to echo what um, Gaurav has just said, is that we have to identify what people actually care about. And when I think about the energy transition work, we don't go into homes and, uh, and ask people, you know, how much they care about um, carbon emissions being reduced. But if switching from a gas stove to an electric stove actually lowers energy bills. That is very meaningful for a lot of people. Um, a lot of people face energy insecurity where, um, you know, the incapacity of covering their bills is something that is just a constant stressor in their life. And so having that taken away and, and lifted for them is actually a lot more um, meaningful and imminent uh, of, a, of, of an issue than, than climate change. So it might not be that they don't care about climate, but they prioritize, you know, um, the the economic stability. So having those conversations and identifying the real needs is really crucial. Thank you so much. For sure, I talk a lot about the equity, the health, and the economic benefits, just to name a few. I mean, they're all there. Um, I think it's always sad that we have to make the case, right? I mean, uh, prevent prevention, like we talked about earlier, wearing the mask alone should just kind of speak for itself. But clearly, we still have a lot of work to do with where people are coming from um, and potentially what is the biggest barrier for them. Uh, but again, we, we're hearing a lot about collaborative spirits, breaking down the systems, being very truthful about the system that truly is dependent we have a system here in the U.S. that is dependent on the production of harmful chemicals that is polluting a lot of our way of life. Um, we have to first admit that in order to be able to change course in a much uh, even increased fundamental way. And I will also acknowledge a lot of us have seen this um, evolution happen in the climate discussion to finally also include climate and health. Having this session today, uh, phenomenal. You know, So I, I know there's a lot more that uh, we definitely would like to talk about. If you all could take literally 30 seconds in this final question, uh, Gorab, you mentioned some of the things that the current uh, Biden administration is already positioning to do, uh, the infrastructure work, uh, definitely trying not to focus in and lean on an equity washing, the contribution and the um, investment in 40% of uh, historically disadvantaged communities. What else? What else would you like to throw out uh, that hopefully if you had your choice, you'd like to see some leadership from this uh, administration? Well, you know, I, we, we've got to pass bills, you know, and, and we got to, you know, what I would just say is we got to make people's lives better, right? And I think that climate change is a manifestation of the ways in which we haven't invested in people's lives. People are scrambling and trying to survive too much. Uh, I have patients who are essential workers and had to go into work during the surges of COVID and got infected and then went back because of uh, the housing crisis uh, spread it among their home and then were breathing air pollution. So, um, my argument was is to embrace the bigness. It's time to invest into our communities. It's time to invest into our health and our planet. Um, and I just think that we need to say that is totally possible and we can do it. Thank you so much. Any quick words from Ms. Beth or Shasta on that question? More funding. <laughs> I always could use that in a very strategic way. Ms. Beth? More green jobs. Yes, yes, thank you. I, I honestly cannot thank you all enough. This was a fantastic discussion. Please encourage all partic uh, participants to reach out to these fantastic panelists. I know there's a lot more to say. Um, and next we have a quick word from the American Climate Leadership Summit sponsors, and then Rebecca will walk us through what we can expect in the breakout groups that are coming up next. So stay tuned and enjoy the rest of your day. Hi, I'm Rebecca Rear, Director of the Climate for Health program at EcoAmerica. Climate for Health partners with many of the largest health membership organizations and institutions, reaching more than 1.4 million health professionals to catalyze climate action. We provide strategy, communications, guidance, training, and resources tailored to the health community, like our Let's Talk Health and Climate Guide, our Moving Forward Guide, and our Mental Health and Climate Change Report, all of which are available for free on our website. Our work is rooted in building climate solutions that advance health equity and address environmental injustices. 
We're all feeling the health impacts from climate change and Americans trust health leaders for information on climate. The time is now for health professionals across disciplines to work with their peers, patients, and policymakers for healthy people on a healthy planet. Join us and check out the resources on climateforhealth.org. Make sure you subscribe to our blog and newsletter. Follow at climate, the number four, health, on Twitter for the latest resources and details about our monthly Let's Talk Climate webcast, ambassadors trainings, and more. Thanks. Whew, what a costume change. Ah, thank you, Ense, and all of our speakers today. Now, all of you are going to have a chance to talk further about the subjects we covered in today's forum while networking with each other. This is a time for your active participation and discussion and for us to hear directly from you. In just a moment, you will see four topics come up in the Action Center on the Materials tab. One, mental health and climate change, solution synergy. Two, solutions that multi-solve for COVID and climate. Three, health, justice, and climate, making the connection. And four, local health and climate action. The discussions on each of these topics will be hosted on separate Zoom lines. Click on the Zoom line for the topic you'd like to discuss. When the, screen, when the Zoom screen opens, you'll be greeted by EcoAmerica staff and then by your discussions moderator who will provide further instructions. Your discussions will directly inform the recommendations report from the summit. So help the moderator out in the conversation to record your thoughts. After your discussions, at 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern, please toggle back over to the streaming platform, where you are right now, for our closing reflections. Enjoy the discussions.